In 1968, almost every American knew what these were, hippies. A few of the estimated 16 million cultural rebels who abandoned 1950s notions about how life in America should be lived. And by 1968, almost everyone in America knew what these people were too, student protesters, activists, part of a small but vocal group of political rebels who were fighting not only to end a war, but to transform, even dismantle, the American system. And this is Jerry Rubin. To try to make sense of the 60s, you have to listen to what he was telling America in 1968. You know, you know America is so obsessed with bad breath and with underarm deodorant. These are the biggest problems in the world. If you watch uh, television at prime times, advertising is not, is not concerned about poverty, not concerned about race oppression, not concerned about the police, but the biggest problem is, is your hair groomed? And what's it like under your arms? And do you have bad breath? And this is the American obsession. And so, and so I, think that, I think that a generation of kids which says, we don't care about your concepts of cleanliness is a revolutionary generation. We to understand the effect Jerry Rubin and others like him had on America, you have to see them for what they were. They were people who had most Americans convinced that hippies and political activists marched hand in hand. But for the most part, they never did. I was in college in uh, early 64, and I read in the San Francisco Chronicle that a rock and roll band from England was going to be on the Ed Sullivan Show. So I thought I would go to the commons room in my dorm and watch it. And I figured there'd be five or six people there, as there usually were, and we'd have the usual argument about what to watch, and I hoped I would get to see this. And instead, there were hundreds of people in this room, and everybody there for the same reason. God knows why. I think there must have been some sense that it's time for something new to happen, and maybe this is going to be it. The music was something that you could talk about with your friends, and that you couldn't talk about with people who were older than you. It gave people a sense of generational solidarity and a sense that they were different and a sense different from the rest of the country, different from any other generation in American history, that they were in some ways special and blessed. And it gave them a sense of being embattled, of, of, of being considered outsiders, reprobates, bad people. These kids may not look like it, but they are the leading edge of a youth rebellion, a movement that would ignite one of the most powerful and pervasive cultural shifts in United States history. understand how and why so many people stopped conforming to the rules, remember that appearances are misleading. And especially in the 1960s, appearances were very important. 
A perfect example is hair. Do you think we have got some kind of say? Well, this one has, you know, it's stuck on good and proper now. <laughs> is that a beetle haircut you've yes. got? How'd you work it out? Well, I just put my hair up around until it's all messy. <laughs> what do your parents say about it? They don't like it. Are you a boy? You would physically get approached and, you know, you know, queers or whatever it was, you know. You know, a lot of people did not understand long hair at all. They really, it was really a threat to them. It was really, uh, it really flew in the face of conventionalism. And long hair was a flag for someone. You could see somebody across the street, and if they had long hair, you knew how they thought. You knew that they were into good music. You knew that they were into... Uh, uh, a reasonable life, you knew that their thought processes, you knew that they probably hated the government, you knew that they probably knew where the best dr uh, drugs were, you knew that, they, that it was someone that you could just nod to and have this understanding between. Anybody that had really short hair, you knew what short hair meant. Strange, isn't it? Well, uh, there are a great number of people, they stopped taking haircuts all together mainly around colleges, number one. Number two, even those which do take haircuts, they come so in su such long intervals, it isn't funny anymore. A style, a flag of membership, a conscious act of defiance. What made long hair such a confusing and profound symbol was that it could mean any and all of these things. And to the dismay of the older generation, millions of young people suddenly began to care a great deal about looking like they didn't care how they looked. Sometimes I was ashamed to introduce them to some people. I just thought of that. Because <laughs> they were just, you know, sometimes the way they dressed and the way they appeared, it just didn't quite suit me <laughs> to introduce them to some of my friends. If parents were uncomfortable with the way their sons and daughters were beginning to look, imagine how confused they'd become when they saw how this... fact that there was a, also an, a, an enormous amount of sex, much more. I think there's no doubt that people were having an awful lot more sex than people of their of the same age had had a decade before. Certainly, certainly in the 50s. Um, I mean, I came, uh, I became interested in girls in the in the middle 50s, and believe me, it was all talk <laughs> until the 1960s. My baby does the hanky pain. Physical desire is very normal and it happens and it's sometimes everything just comes down to a very basic level and there's nothing wrong with it. I think that sex is just much groovier when there's love, you know. There's a lot more happening. But there's nothing wrong with just sex for sex. Such talk was not only provocative, but at the time, downright immoral. This generation seemed determined to tear down conventions that had, in 1950s America, defined proper behavior. And it's somewhat ironic to think that scientists Use of another drug, marijuana, would further separate members of this generation not only from their parents, but also from their inhibitions. Ass was important because it was, it did describe us, like them and us, kind of. 
of course, we all grew up 18, 19, 20 years of being rigid little, you know, puppets or something. And suddenly, the grass relaxed us. It allowed us to be the people we really are, or really were. In high school, my girlfriend Ann and I went around with Jim and Bob. They both smoked pot. That's jive talk for marijuana. I'd been smoking pot for quite a while before I met Chuck. I guess he was what the newspapers call a, a peddler. He had the heroin habit. But before I knew it, I was hooked. Bad. Around this time, millions of young people tried marijuana or knew someone who did. In response, films like this were shown in schools to curtail the growing marijuana problem. But students who saw these films knew that most marijuana smokers weren't going crazy or becoming heroin addicts. So many kids concluded they were being lied to. And they'd have to find the truth for themselves, even if it meant breaking the law. I, I think making love when you're, you're turned on in, in any sense is 100% better. I mean, just fantastic. I turned on a girl for the uh, first time this vacation. And she said afterwards that, like, any time I touch her, it was just soft and tender. You know, it wasn't the harsh or an act. It was just like floating in, you know, just like two jellies almost gliding into each other. It was just different. I, I sat for an hour with the girl, and we both just explored each other's faces with our fingers, you know? And it was, it was just beautiful. I mean, it's just incredible because, well, that, that's, that's your attitude toward everything. I mean, it's just, you, you want to re-examine things that you've just taken for granted. I remember arriving at college, and the worst part was my parents left. And there I was sitting in this room. It was boring. And next door, there were two guys playing a record by a group called The Mother's Invention. And, the, and what it was was Susie Cream Cheese. Or I guess it was The Fugs, and it was called Susie Cream Cheese. And what it was was it's um, an oral account of sexual intercourse, screaming next door. And here I am, this naive kid, and I have no idea what all this noise is. There's an upperclassman next door with a whip who's banging it on the floor as hard as he can. And then there's this guy who is obviously, um, I'd never met anybody who used drugs, who was obviously on drugs, uh, writing on a table outside my room. Now, when I say writing on a table, I don't mean writing on a piece of paper or on a table. I mean, this guy's writing on a table. And I sat there in the rain listening to this, thinking, my life has just ended. And I thought, I better write somebody a letter. And I wrote, here I am at college, and this is wonderful. Um, I'm just loving being here, thinking, I hope I can make it through the week. stimuli out there were so many. There were so many things to try and to do that every time I tried one, I began to ask myself, gee, who am I? What am I about? And I remember going through some severe depressions trying to figure out the answer to that question. Sometimes I thought I had it, and indeed I did. Sometimes for hours or days. I remember one day sitting on a beach, talking to friends when I realized, I understand it all. I comprehend the whole world and it's working. Uh, that lasted for several days uh, before I realized you don't understand any of it. Uncertainty was not something parents wanted to hear from their children. Parents, after all, had worked hard to direct their kids along the smoothest path to success. But with ever-increasing numbers of young people exploring alternative directions, the fundamental cultural tension of the era emerged. It came to be called the generation gap. The, for me, the cutting edge was I thought that life, had, the world had changed, that everything which had perhaps given meaning to life in the past, all the traditions, whether it was religion, manners, dress, marriage, family, everything, all of that had collapsed. My father seems to have already settled down, settled into his ways, settled, knows what's right, knows what's wrong. 
And every time I want to say something to him, I don't want to be settled down. Even no matter what I say, this is not a final decision. I want to just sort of try things out. And trying things out on parents never seem to work. You can't try things out. So the best thing I can do with my father is tell jokes. I mean, that's sort of, you know, uh, that's something, because that's sort of, you know, that's all right. That's safe. Uh, and it doesn't get you into problems. I had a strong feeling that these children were rebels without a cause. They had everything. They could have had everything. And I found it very hard initially to see what they were rebelling against. When the Vietnam War came along and the big straw, the, the, the peace demonstrations, uh, you know, at least focused on something. But initially, when they started dropping out from society, I was baffled because I thought it was a pretty good society they were dropping out from. And I couldn't see what they had that was going to replace it or that was better. It could possibly be better. Being happy. Just being happy. 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 No matter how, if you're happy, then you're a success. I mean, if you're a bum and you're happy being a bum, you should stay a bum. You're just helping people you're happy. You're happy. You're happy. This kind of talk about happiness seems like the typically naive enthusiasm of adolescence. But as with the issue of hair, here's another instance where appearances can be misleading. The parents want you to make money, go to school, have a nice job. I don't want to have a nice job. I'll do anything as long as I'm happy. In the 1960s, this belief that happiness could be a goal in itself would take on historical significance. To be happy, what does it mean? Let me put it this way to you. Do you think this country, at this time, needs something that it hasn't got? Yes. What does it mean? Love. The whole people have to know each other, you know? What about people older than, say, 30? Older people, do you think they can indulge in this too? Yes, they should. Do they? I don't know if they do, but they should. What do you think older people think of all this? Most of them think it's ridiculous. Why do you think they think it's ridiculous? Because I don't think it can be done. <laughs> Are you a part of the love generation? Yes. Do you love me? Yes, I love everybody. Is it possible to love everybody? Yes. How come? How come people haven't loved everybody for 2,000 years? Because they've been mixed up. Be happy. Love one another. Age-old concepts, but at a time of unprecedented affluence, a time when much of society was still clinging to 1950s conformities, most importantly, a time when the massive baby boom generation was coming of age, these concepts would emerge as the guiding doctrines of a values revolution what would come to be known as the counterculture. Do you take drugs? Huh? Do you take drugs? No. Would you ever take drugs? Yes. You would? No. Why? I'm, I'm experimental. I'm experimental. What a lot of the uh, members of the counterculture came to see was that um, changing people's cultural values may have to do with changing their state of consciousness. And hence you get this fascination with anything that will change people's mode of perception. They open the doors of perception, right? It could be drugs. The fascination with drugs was not fun in games in the 60s. For many people, it was a way to see reality differently. And hopefully, therefore, to change your values. I've taken acid three times. That's all. And uh, I reckon you people ought to know about acid, too. Acid's a hoax biggest hoax of the century. Acid doesn't exist. Don't you know it's tasteless, odorless, colorless? Just something in the mind. Here's one of the truly fateful twists in this tale of cultural rebellion. A collision that put the most potent psychochemical ever invented, LSD, into the hands of millions of young people passionately searching for something new. LSD was only vaguely understood by the most qualified researchers. What was LSD doing to these people? I believe that the inner body, the inner soul, that we don't need money, and we don't need the cars and other things. In fact, I've had the feelings that I want to give away all my things to people who need them, who want to live in the society with others, and start anew inside myself. This was a question that the authorities were very interested in. 
Everybody that took LSD felt that they were undergoing enormous personal changes. They weren't the same person after having LSD. And there was a scientific study, it was done by a Rand scientist, and in 1966 he published his findings and what he said was, even though all of these people said that they felt enormous changes had taken place, the personality test showed that they were largely the same person in every area but one area. And this was called the ways to live scale. The ways to live scale indicated that one dose of LSD uh, stimulated enormous changes, whereas this, the, uh, the person taking the test might have said, it's important for me to get a corporate job, it's important for me to have a good car. After one dose of LSD, they were saying, I think maybe a contemplative lifestyle might be what I want to have. Uh, I think I'd like to travel before settling down. I think uh, maybe I want to look for some spiritual value in my life. Things totally changed around. The LSD trip is best understood as a religious pilgrimage. The LSD kick. Timothy Leary was the psychedelic ecstasy. movement's prophet of perception, a high-profile LSD, LSD advocate LSD who was scaring the yeah. hell out of mainstream first, America. Uh, science and Declaration of Independence uh, said life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness means the right to get high. Tomorrow's it's going to be happy. Kids just don't buy that whole uh, uptight, uh, keep your legs crossed, uh, pure method. The aim of the game is to feel good. And the function of government is to get everyone high and feel good. It's uh, odorless, colorless, tasteless. Leary was it's, alarming uh, because he was I proposing to radically alter fundamental institutions. He was terrifying because it seemed like some of America's best and brightest young people were listening to him. I took a hit of Osley White Lightning Acid, and I became an instant hippie. I fell in love with nature, and I looked at the rocks. I could sit there looking at weeds that were normally an item of horror to my parents and trip on the intricate structures of ragweed and thistle plant. And I began to become a discerning acid head. I only took it every three days, mind you so that I could clean up properly and, and, and all. But the real issue was when I went to San Francisco in 1967, in the summer. It was the love that bought me into the hippie movement. The Council for a Summer of Love proclaims a summer of love in the city of San Francisco. We believe that Haight-Ashbury is the focus of a universal spiritual awakening. The summer of love is an expression of this awakening. We call upon the world to help us celebrate the infinite holiness of life.
Sometimes of the hippies, besides taking drugs, are partying, seminars, and groups of discussions. There was festivals and concerts and, and uh, the religious groups uh, popped up and the Hare Krishnas were there and we'd all go and hang out over in one group and chant and home with them and then we'd go to another group and dance with them and it was, it was like a big party. Many of the residents of Haight-Ashbury were seriously trying to construct an alternative society, one with an alternative press. People think of newspapers as institutions. We don't try to cater to the audience so much as shape and develop those people that are ready to rebel in the society. With alternative business and enterprise. With alternative religions. The majority of young people are very interested in Eastern philosophy, perhaps because they're unsatisfied with uh, their own philosophy or religion. And perhaps most important of all, the people of the hate were committed to new kinds of social welfare. Listen, you take your beads and your shirt off here. There was alternative everything, because this was a community that was throwing out the old rules and living by an entirely new set of values. The concept of love is a public phenomenon, the mention of love in a public way, be outside of the church. This is the first uh, I heard of it. You know, love, peace, man, you know, the love and peace. That was the uh, refrain. Uh, the concept was that life was there to be experienced fully, to experience everything. 